Content warning. The Matherson marriage contains unhealthy relationship dynamics and fictional domestic abuse. If you are in a real-life Matherson marriage, please reach out to the appropriate authorities for help. Resources you may find helpful include the Pixel Project's Domestic Violence Resource page and UN Women's International Helplines list. Resources will be linked in the video description for accessibility. Hi, I'm Morgan, and today I will be reading to you from The Matherson Marriage by Ruby M. Ayers. Chapter 7 The meeting was so unexpected that Pansy so stood still with a little gasp, the soft color flooding her face. It seemed a travesty that she should have gone away to escape this man, and that he should be the first to meet her on her return. Ramston took the meeting coolly enough. Buster was clinging to his hand and chattering, and Ramston glanced down at the child amusedly before he spoke to Pansy. I came to meet you. Matherson is in town on business. He had to go off this morning unexpectedly, so I offered to take his place. It's good of you to trouble, but you should not have done so, Pansy said. Gates could have come quite well. I am surprised at Basil bothering you. Oh, it's no bother, he answered easily. I've brought my own car. Is there much bug is there much luggage? I think we can take it all. He went off with Buster to speak to the porter, and Pansy stood looking after them with a sense of impending with a sense of impending calamity. She dared not admit how glad she was to see him. She tried only to be angry with Basil. She looked pale and worried when presently she followed Ramston to the car. Buster was clamoring round him. Sit beside you and drive, he demanded imperiously. Ramsden laughed. <laughs> you may sit beside me if mother doesn't want to, he said. Ladies first, you know, sonny boy. Pansy spoke hurriedly. I'd much rather sit at the back. Lynn lifted Buster into a seat and brought a rug to Pansy. You'd better have it, he insisted when she refused. Oh, I know it's warm, but the roads are dusty. Pansy gave in silently. It seemed odd that this man, who had once been her abject slave, should now give himself calm authority over her. I hope you have enjoyed your holiday, he said as he shut the door. I don't think you look much better for the change. Pansy felt chagrined. I didn't really need a change, she answered. I only went to see my father. I see. I hope he is well. He isn't, at least, not very, she sighed. He seems to be getting old all at once. He sent his love to you, and so did Violet, she added deliberately. Violet, Ramsden laughed. Oh, I'd almost forgotten her. She was a child in the old days, wasn't she? I don't think I saw a great deal of her. She isn't a child now, Pansy said. I suppose not. I should like to see her. He took a seat beside Buster and drove off. Pansy leaned back with a sigh. She had come home with so many good intentions, and this was how they had started. The first sight of Lynn Ramston had upset her determination and left her in turmoil. She looked at him with critical eyes, his broad shoulders and the lean brown face which she could only see now and which she could only see now and then when he turned to speak to Buster. Yes, Violet would fall in love with him, she was sure. Violet, who was so like what she herself had been six years ago. When they reached Green Gables, Lynn spoke to her. Matherson asked me to tell you he would be home to dinner, he said, a smile in his eyes. He also invited me to tea and dinner. Pansy flushed painfully, and he added, I felt the invitation open. Sorry, I left the invitation open in case you might find me in the way. Of course not. Please stay. But she went into the house without waiting for him, leaving Buster to Joyce. Why did Basil try? Why did Basil trouble Mr. Ramsden to meet us? She asked Joyce angrily when they met upstairs. Joyce raised her brows. I'm sure I don't know. I suppose he offered. Pansy, why are those two men such friends? Pansy laughed cynically. <laughs> to annoy me, I should think, she answered. To annoy you? Joyce caught the words up quickly. Pansy turned away to her own room. I don't mean that, but it's very aggravating. Directly I come home to find a visitor here. She tried to speak as if she were angry, but it was a poor attempt, and her cheeks burned as she shut the door. Hypocrite! She accused her flushed reflection. Outside in the garden, she could hear Buster's shrill voice and Lynn Ramsden's laugh. She looked out of the window and saw them crossing the lawn hand in hand. And there was chickens and ducks and Auntie Vi, she heard Buster reiterating excitedly. Oh, it was a lovely, lovely place. They disappeared amongst the trees beyond, and Pansy went down to the drawing room. Tea was laid, and Joyce was pouring out. She took many little duties from Pansy's shoulders in a quiet, unobtrusive way, and Pansy looked up at her affectionately. 
I don't know what I should do without you, she said. Joyce flushed with pleasure. You seem to have done without me quite well during the last ten days, she protested. That was Hobson's choice, Pansy declared. It's now I've got you again that I wonder how I managed to exist without you. Joyce brought her some tea. I wonder where the others are. In the garden. I saw Buster hand in hand with Mr. Ramsden. Pansy's voice sounded wary. It's queer how children make such sudden friendships. I don't think it's queer where Mr. Ramsden's concerned, Joyce answered warmly. He's a dear. I frankly love him. The color rose to Pansy's face, and her hand trembled as she stirred her tea. She turned to look out of the window. Here they come, Joyce said suddenly, and laughed. Oh, my word, do come and look, Pansy. Talk about St. Paul's and the, pepper and the pepper pot. But Pansy did not move. I saw them, she answered, and the next moment Buster and Ramsden were in the room. There was a dandelion with an absurdly long stalk dangling from Ramsden's buttonhole. He looked at Pansy with twinkling eyes as he sat down beside her. I'm sorry we're late, but Buster felt it was his duty to make a tour of inspection, as he had been away from home so long. There's no ducks here, Dolly, Buster said mournfully. Perhaps Aunt Vi will send you some, Pansy hastened to console him. She looked at Ramston. I wonder why Basil had to go I wonder why Basil had to go to town. He shook his head. I don't know. I came over this morning and he just received a wire. He went off in a great hurry, didn't he, Miss Lindsay? And he asked me to stay till he came back. I haven't a change of clothes with me, but I shouldn't change either, Pansy interrupted. What does it matter? And they had finished tea, and Joyce carried Buster off to wash the cake crumbs from his face. There was a little silence. Do you mind if I smoke? Ramsden asked. Please do. Pansy went to, op went to the open window. Why can't I behave naturally, she was asking herself in despair. I'm no more to him than any other woman in the world, and why can't I look at him and behave naturally? But her heart was throbbing violently, when presently he came across the room and stood beside her. You, you get a fine view from this window, he said. Yes, Pansy forced herself to turn. What business has Basil got with you? she asked abruptly. There was a moment of silence before he answered guardedly. It's hardly business. Mr. Matheson has been kind enough to put me on to some good investments, that's all. Oh, I see. She gave a quick sigh. I thought it was something terribly important, as he was so anxious I... She broke off, realizing how nearly she had betrayed her husband's instructions. So, I... so anxious you what? he asked. Oh, nothing. She looked out across the beautiful garden again, and thought suddenly of the wilderness that lay all around the vicarage, the tangle of roses and the briar bush in the corner, and she said... Do you remember the rustic archway you made outside Father's study window at home? It's still there. It's tumbling down a bit now, of course. Ramsden laughed reminiscently. <laughs> I remember. I built it as an excuse to keep calling it the vicarage. It took a long time to complete, didn't it? Foolish tears swam into Pansy's eyes. It hurt to hear him speak of to hear him speak of the old days so casually. Of course, she knew that he no longer cared anything for their memory, but it hurt all the same. I must go back someday and see it all, he went on. I should very much like to see Mr. Tremaine again. The village hasn't altered a bit, she told him eagerly. It's just as it, it's just as it was. Not a new house or cottage, hardly a tree cut down. It seemed like walking back into the past with nothing changed. Unlike us, then, Ramsden said. Pansy laughed recklessly. <laughs> yes, I suppose we've we've changed a great deal. I suppose you can see it in me as strongly as I can in you. He looked down at her. Perhaps I haven't changed as much as you think, he said slowly. Dolly! Dolly! Buster came rushing into the room, and Pansy was spared a reply, but the words haunted her all the evening. Perhaps I haven't changed as much as you think. What had he meant? Nothing, of course, but the words stayed warm in her heart. Shall I go along and meet Matherson? Ramsden asked later. There's a train at 640, I know. He'll probably come by that, as he said he should be back to dinner. Pansy answered that there was no need. Gates would go. Then she changed her mind and said that perhaps Basil would be pleased if he went. Ramsden looked at her. Will you come with me? he asked. She drew back quickly. I, oh, oh, no, there's no need. Why, why should I? So Ramsden went alone, and in half an hour is back alone. From her window, Pansy saw him turn into the drive, and tried not to feel glad that Basil was not with him. I suppose he's lost. I suppose he lost the train, she said when they met downstairs. It's a pity, because there isn't another till nearly ten. We'll have dinner, I think. 
Joyce did most of the talking at dinner, and Pansy was thankful for her presence. A tete a tete meal with Ramsden would have been more than she could stand. It was difficult enough afterwards when Joyce slipped away. Pansy rose. It's so hot, she said. She pushed the French window wide and went out onto the lawn. There were some garden chairs close by, and she sat down, thankful for the friendly darkness that hid her face. And then Ramsden followed. Will you smoke? he asked. If you won't be shocked, she laughed nervously. <laughs> Basil thinks a woman who smokes is past praying for. He's frightfully old-fashioned in some ways. She took a cigarette from his case, and Ramsden stuck, struck a match, shading it from the faint light breeze with his hand. Do you think you can manage to get a light? he asked, bending down to her. Their hands touched, and Pansy drew back. I... I won't smoke after all. I don't really care about it, she said sharply. No, please don't bother. She leaned back in the chair away from him. Ramsden lit his own cigarette, and for an instant she saw his face in the flare of the match, and his eyes, which were looking down at her with a curious expression in their steadiness. The absurd, long-stocked dandelion still dangled from his coat, and Pansy laughed hysterically as she pointed to it. <laughs> Was that the best flower you could find? Buster gave it to me. Her eyes softened in the darkness. He seems to have taken a great fancy to you. Has he? In front of children. He went back to the chair beside her. It was so silent in the garden. The only sound was the soft sighing of the wind in the trees. Pansy moved restlessly. I wonder what has kept Basil. Yes, it's disappointing for you after having been away so long. She echoed his words mockingly. <laughs> so long? It's only ten days. Ramston sat up and flicked the ash from his cigarette. Only ten days? It seems much longer than that to me. Pansy turned her head, but it was too dark to see his face. Is, is that meant to be a compliment? She asked. No. You're very candid, he laughed. <laughs> Why not? We're such old friends. Does that give you the right to say what you please to me? It's going to give me the excuse to ask you a question. I have wanted to ask you. It's going to give me the excuse to ask you a question I've wanted to ask ever since we met the other day. Ramsden answered determinedly. For a moment, Pansy closed her eyes to the dark garden and the soft starlight. May I? he urged. She forced a laugh. <laughs> why, why not? As you say, we are such old friends. Oh, what is it? She could feel rather than see that he leaned towards her as he asked. Pansy, why are you so afraid of me? Her hands mechanically gripped the arms of the chair in which she sat, and it was some seconds before she echoed his question mechanically. Afraid of you? Why? What do you mean? Only just what I say. You don't like me coming here. You hate being left alone with me. You're hating it this very minute. Lynn's voice was quiet and determined. It's no use denying it, Pansy. I understand you too well, but I'm, but I'm afraid I can't help you or put things right if you won't tell me what I've done to offend you. Pansy caught her breath with a gasp. I'm, I'm not offended. You haven't done anything to offend me. It's absurd. How could you? You imagine things. Do I? I don't think so. You hated it when I told you I had bought Chris... You hated it when I told you I had bought Chiswells. You dislike it because you're... Because Matherson and I are friends. You were not pleased to see me at the station this afternoon, and I think the least you can do is, tell, is to tell me why. I have nothing to tell you. It's too silly. It's nothing to do with me. If you choose to live at Chiswell's, and I... I thought it was very kind of you to meet us this afternoon. Did you? He laughed grimly. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't want to be rude. But I'm not credulous enough to believe that. He turned in his chair to try and see her face. Is it because you still dislike me as much as you did six years ago? He asked. No. Thank you. There is a note of sarcasm in his voice. Then I suppose if you don't dislike me, you must like me. Is that it? I'm glad to hear that at least. And I'm not... I'm glad to hear that at least. And I'm sure Matherson will be delighted. He is quite anxious for you and me to be good friends. Probably he told you. He said something about it. Yes. Pansy's voice sounded muffled. And if you've got the least doubt that I harbor any resentment for what occurred years ago, Ramsden went on cheerfully, I assure you. Pansy broke in. Oh, don't. Please, don't. There was a hysterical note in her voice, and she rose suddenly to her, to her feet. It's cold here. Shall we go indoors? I'll see where Joyce is. She turned back to the house, but Ramsden was too quick for her. He barred the way. And you say you're not afraid of me, and that you don't dislike my company, he said, half in fun, half offendedly. 
Yes, I... Pansy broke down suddenly and hid her face in her hands. Pansy! He peered at her through the darkness. He put out a hand and touched her arm. Why, you're not crying, he said uncertainly. But for the moment, Pansy had quite lost control of herself. Memories seemed to be rising all around her out of the darkness, whispering of the many things she had thrown aside with this man's love. And his own impartial, friendly questioning had been the last straw. Oh, if, if you'd only go away or let me go, she whispered brokenly. There was a moment of profound silence. Then Ramston stood aside and Pansy fled back to the house. She was terrified of the overwhelming storm of emotion in her heart. She locked herself in her room and walked up and down, sobbing and wringing her hands. She only controlled her voice with a difficulty when someone tapped at the door. At her door. Yes, what is it? It's only Joyce. Joyce tried the handle as she spoke. May I come in? Aren't you well? Do let me in. I'm coming down directly. Mr. Ramston's alone. Go and tell... Talk to him for me, like a Christian, will you? There's been a telephone call from Mr. Matherson. Oh, Pansy was hurriedly drying her tears. What did he say? He rang up from town. He won't be home at all tonight. Oh, there was trembling relief in Pansy's heart. Her voice was steadier when she spoke again. Oh, be down directly. Do go and talk to Mr. Ramsden, there's a dear. Very well. Joyce turned away reluctantly. There was a disturbed pucker between her steady eyes. Pansy had been crying, she was sure, from the little tremble in her voice. Why? She had been all right at dinner, and there was no basil to have said anything harsh or unkind. She felt unhappy as she went through the dining room into the garden. The light from behind her made a bright little half-circle where Pansy and Lynn Ramsden had been sitting, and she could see him there, his hands hanging dejectedly between his knees, his head down bent. Joyce stood looking at him for a moment. Then she half shrugged her shoulders and moved forward. Pansy says I am to talk to you till she comes down. Ramson started and rose to his feet. That's very kind, he said with an effort. Take this chair, will you? And will you smoke? Joyce laughed. <laughs> I should like to, but it's one of the things I won't allow myself to do in case Buster should catch me. It would be such a shocking example for him. He'll probably be doing it some... He'll probably be doing it himself before very long. Ramston sat down beside her. Buster seems a general favorite. Yes, and isn't he the image of Pansy? He is. It's a pity he's an only child. Joyce went on. I think only children are always a mistake. It's tempting providence. Ramston did not answer. Mr. Matherson isn't coming home tonight, Joyce said after a moment. He's just run through, he's just run through from London. Really? Then I ought to be getting back. I only stayed to see if he came by the last train, he half rose, and Joyce said. It's quite early yet. Pansy will be down directly. I don't think she looks well, do you? Doesn't she? I don't think so. Her holiday doesn't seem to have done her a bit of good. She's got one of her bad headaches tonight again, and she'd no right to have one. I'm sorry. She seemed all right at dinner. That's her way. Pansy never owns up till she feels so bad she doesn't know what to do. But I understand her, and I know that it me and I know what it means when she's been crying. Crying? Joyce laughed apologetically. Oh <laughs> I shouldn't have told you. She'd be angry if she knew if she knew. But she was crying when I went up to her just now. She's very highly strung. Ramston could feel that she was looking at him, and after the slightest hesitation she added I love her. She's been kinder to me than anyone I've ever met. I'd never forgive anyone who hurt her or made her unhappy. She waited, but Ramston said nothing, and she asked, You like just well, Mr. Ramston? Very much indeed. Why? I only wondered. I thought perhaps the air around here might not be good for you. He stared at her in amazement. Not good for me, he repeated. I never felt better in my life. Joyce leaned back in her chair, and her hands trembled as she folded them in her lap, but her voice was steady as she answered, that's a pity, because I'm sure this place is not good for you, Mr. Ramsden. And now it was impossible to mistake her meaning, but he would not admit his understanding. You are kind to be so interested in me, he said. Joyce sat up with a stiff movement. It isn't you I'm interested in, she said bluntly. He rose to his feet. Miss Lindsay, I... Joyce rose also. It's no good being angry with me, she said, and she spoke in deep earnestness. I always say what I mean, and I mean what I say. Please, she broke off. Here is Pansy. She added quickly. Pansy stood at the open window, looking down at looking down at them. Basil isn't coming home, as Joyce told you, she asked. Yes, I'm sorry. I was just saying it's time I made a move. I'll send for your car. She turned back into the room, but Joyce followed. Let me go. Good night, Mr. Ramsden. Good night, Miss Lindsay. I wonder what has kept Basil, Pansy said. She was moving nervously about the room, avoiding Ramsden's eyes. He didn't say. 
No, I dare say he'll be home first thing in the morning. She was back at the window now, looking into the garden. You'll have a lovely drive home. Yes, he was staring beside her. He was standing beside her. Do you remember that old car I hired at Lidstow to take you for a moonlit ride? I couldn't, I couldn't drive for nuts, and you laughed at me. <laughs> yes. Pansy bit her lip to keep it from trembling. If only he would leave the past alone, things would not be so bad. She would take care that she was never again left alone with him like this. The evening had been a torture to her, and yet now it was so nearly over she would have given anything to have kept him with her. It hurt her pride to think that the tables were turned, and that she was the one who cared while he was so indifferent, and yet she thanked God in her heart that it was so, for if the old adoring lover she had known years ago had been beside her now, she looked at him defiantly. I suppose you've had lots of romantic moonlit rides since then, she said. No, she laughed. <laughs> oh, well, they've still to come then. I should like to think so. She caught her breath with a little nervous sound. Well, there is plenty of women in the, there are plenty of women in the world. A servant came to the door. Mr. Ramston's car is here, madame. Ramston went into the hall to get his coat, and Pansy followed. She went out of the front door. There was a pale moon in the sky, and it shone down on the garden. And it shone down on the garden through the dark trees, making a silvery tra making a silver tracery on the lawn. Ramston came out. You won't be venturesome, and let me take you for a run. He asked. Pansy hesitated. She would have loved it better than anything in the world, but she was afraid. She shook her head. I, I don't think so. It's late. She looked back into the hall and saw Joyce coming down the stairs. Mr. Ramston's invited me to go for a moonlit drive, she said recklessly. It's too late. You'll take cold, Joyce objected quickly. I'm surprised at you, Mr. Ramston. She came across to them. Don't go. You'll take cold, she said again. But opposition always made Pansy reckless. I'll put on a coat. She ran into the house and came back with the coat of her husband's. It was much too large for her. The sleeves hung over her hands, and the collar almost covered her face. Just ten minutes, she said. Joyce's eyes were anxious as she turned to Ramsden. If anything happens to her, she threatened. Pansy laughed excitedly. <laughs> That'd be silly. What could happen? She leaned back with a sigh of pleasure as the car glided off down the drive. The night was very still, and the road seemed quite deserted as they turned out of as they turned out of the grounds. Which way shall we go? Ramston asked, and Pansy answered, Where you like, I don't mind. And then for a mile or so, neither of them spoke till Pansy touched his arm. There's the church clock striking ten. Take me back, please. Very well. He backed the car into a little by into a little by lane to turn it, and as he brought it round on the main road, the engine stopped. You're bad driving, Pansy said lightly. I admit it. He looked down at her, and the pale moonlight shone right onto her face, with its closely folded lips and troubled eyes. What are you thinking about? he asked. What am I thinking about? Pansy repeated, a note of defiance in her voice. Perhaps you would be surprised if I told you. Try me and see. She shook her head. No, I think it, I think it's too risky. And drive on, Lynn. I really ought to be going home. I thought you had registered an eternal vow to call me Mr. Ramsden, he said. I prefer my Christian name, but all the same. Basil doesn't know that I ever knew you well enough to call you by your Christian name, she explained. I see, and you don't wish him to know, is that it? I don't know what ma I don't know that it matters. Will it matter if I call you Pansy? Oh, please don't, she said hastily. I'd much rather you didn't. Not that Basil is a bit jealous, but... Oh, please, drive on. Ramston obeyed silently, and they were nearly home before he spoke again. There was a moon like this the night I hired the old car at Lidstow. Do you remember? Was there? And you made me stop while you picked some wild roses. I remember I thought it was highly romantic, picking flowers by moonlight. <laughs> it was very silly, Pansy declared. I suppose we were all si we are all silly when we're young. We're neither of us very we're neither of us so very old now, Lynn answered. Aren't we? Her voice was wistful. I think I am. I feel old sometimes anyway. You mustn't take life so seriously. I never did until lately, she answered unthinkingly. Until lately, he repeated. Yes, I mean, you're driving very slowly, aren't you? I thought you disliked speed. I can get fifty out of you. I can get fifty out of her if you'd like. No, thank you, she touched his arm. Stop here at the gate, will you? I'll run up to the house. There's no need for you to turn in again. It's no trouble. I'd, I'd rather you didn't, please. 
He brought the car to a standstill and opened the door for her. You're not afraid to go through the garden alone? She laughed scornfully. <laughs> have you forgotten that I'm have you forgotten that I'm a country girl, bred and born? I'll say good night then. He held out his hand, and after the least hesitation she laid hers in it. Good night. I dare say we shall be seeing you again soon. That sounds almost as if you were hoping I shall say no, he answered. Pansy tried to laugh. Her fingers moved restlessly in his clasp. How absurd! It makes no difference to me. I'm glad, he said evenly, because in that case I shall come over to see Matherson in the morning. I will tell him. Thank you, and be sure to tell Miss Lindsay, as she seems so anxious about you, that you have come to no harm. What do you mean? Ravenston laughed. <laughs> Only what I say. Good night, Pansy. He raised her hand to his lips, kissed it, and let her go. She stood in the moonlight, looking after him till the curve of the road hid him from view. Then she walked back to the house. Is that you, Pansy? Joyce's anxious voice came to her out of the darkness, and she roused herself to answer. Yes, did you think we'd been smashed up? It's so late. I wondered what had happened. Pansy laughed. <laughs> Lynn told me to be sure and tell you that I had come to no harm, she said. Joyce fell into step beside her. Oh, did he? She said wryly. They went upstairs together and said good night on the landing. Then Pansy slipped into Buster's room and sat down beside him in the darkness. The room was very silent. The only sound was his soft, even breathing, the faint voice of the night, the faint voice of the night wind in the garden outside. She would see Lynn again tomorrow. What was that? You. What was the use of fighting against fate? It must have been decreed that she was to love him, and she and she knew that she did love him with all her heart and soul. Matherson arrived soon after breakfast the following morning. He had not told Pansy by which train he was traveling, so she had not seen the car to meet him, and he drove the three miles from the station in a hired car. Pansy was in the garden when she saw it turn in. And Pansy was in the garden when she saw it turn in at the gate, a rickety, shabby conveyance, and she guessed what had happened. She flew across the lawn to meet her husband. Oh, Basil! I'm so sorry! Why didn't you let me know what train you were coming by? I'd have met you, of course. He did not answer till he had paid and dismissed the driver. Then he walked back to the house with his wife. He had made no attempt to greet her in any way. Fine thing, having to drive up in that tub, he said angrily, with all the thousands I pay out every year. There are two cars in the garage eating their heads off, and I have to come up in a prehistoric vehicle from the George. If he had found, this, if he had found from the station, Pansy faltered. He strode into the house without answering, and she followed timidly, the old sense of weariness and boredom returning. We expected you last night, she said after a moment. Mr. Ramston was here, and he seemed disappointed. I rang up soon as I could get through, was then gracious answer. He looked at her critically. Your holiday hasn't done you much good, Pansy flushed. Oh, don't you, don't say that. I feel ever so much better. Better, he laughed cynically. I didn't know you'd been ill. She turned hopelessly away, but Matherson followed. You're an affectionate wife, he grumbled. I haven't seen you for a week. This is all the welcome I get. Why do you think I stayed in town? Not for my own pleasure, I promised you. Pansy looked back at him. Why then? She asked resentfully. Matherson explained grand, grandilo, grandiloquently. Business, of course. Trying to benefit you and this is all the thanks I get? She stood twisting her hands nervously. You didn't seem very pleased to see me, she said in a hard little voice. Well, you didn't expect me to kiss you in front of that driver fellow, did you? He asked more good-naturedly. He held out his hand. Come here. She obeyed reluctantly, and he put a casual arm round her and kissed her cheek. You've lost all your roses, he said, dis dissatisfaction in his voice. What's happened to you? At this rate, you'll be an old woman before you're a young one. He meant it jokingly, but Pansy winced. Buster looks well anyway, she said. Oh, Buster, he let her go and frowned. I suppose your father and Violet have done their best to spoil him. They are very fond of him, of course. Fond of him, Matherson repeated testily. So am I fond of him, but I don't spoil him. It's ridiculous. I've been making inquiries, and I shall send him to boarding school next term. Basil. Pansy flushed crimson, and her eyes blazed. He must be mad, she said. Why, he's only a baby. He doesn't even know his alphabet yet. Then he ought to. I knew mine long before I was his age. We can't all be as clever as you are, Pansy answered passionately. Matherson laughed. He always recovered his own temper when he had caused someone else to lose theirs. Well, well, we'll see, he said condescendingly. He produced a little box from his pocket. I've brought you a, pe I've brought you a present. 
Pansy did not turn. Her cheeks felt as if they were on fire, and her heart was throbbing with passionate anger. How dared he talk of sending Buster to school? She would never allow it. Matherson came behind her and put the little box into her hand. Well, don't you want to see it? he asked. For a moment, the angry words trembling on her lips were almost spoken. Take it away. I hate you. But she kept them back. Thank you. Thank you very much. She took the box mechanically and opened it. She looked at the diamond brooch it contained, and her lips quivered. Diamonds! That was all his imagination ever th ever thought she wanted. Thank you. It's, it's lovely, she said. Did you bring Buster anything? she asked. Matherson turned to leave the room. Buster has too many toys already, he answered. When I was his age, I only had a hundredth part of what he has. He went out into the hall and came back to ask, Did Ramsden leave any message for me? He said he would be over this morning. Good. I hope you made yourself pleasant to him last night. Pansy laughed. <laughs> he stayed to, di to dinner and tea. And afterwards, I went, ha I went for a moonlit ride. He stayed to dinner and tea. And afterwards, I went for a moonlit ride with him. She said recklessly. Good. Matherson smiled approvingly. That's right. I dare say he was pleased, wasn't he? Her lips twisted cynically. I can't say that he showed any signs of great joy. Matherson turned on his heel. Don't be sarcastic, my dear, he said. It doesn't suit you. Pansy left the brooch lying in its box on the table and went out into the garden. She felt bitterly discouraged. How could she be blamed, no matter what happened in the, in the future? She and Basil had nothing in common. Hitherto, she had managed to tolerate him and even shown a mild sort of affection, but lately even that had seemed impossible. She cared nothing for him. It overwhelmed her with shame to realize that her only emotion would be infinite relief if she knew she never, if she knew she need never see him again. It's wicked, of course, it's wicked, and I suppose I shall be punished for it, she thought. It's my own fault after all. I need not have married him. I only did it for his money. Oh, poor Basil. She, she, she kept away from the house till lunch. She dreaded meeting Lynn Ramston in her husband's presence. But when she went back to the house, to the house, his car was still in the drive. Is Mr. Ramston staying to lunch? She asked one of the servants, and her heart sank when she heard that he was. She felt that she hated both Lynn and her husband. They were both cruel and inconsiderate. It seemed impossible that no one had the faintest idea of the mental torture she suffered in the presence of the two men. At first she thought she would excuse herself from lunch, but then she realized how useless it would be, and went in with Buster clinging to her hand. You've got to be very, very good, darling, she told him earnestly, and don't make father one teeny, tiny bit cross. Promise me. Buster nodded. Promise, Dodie. But Matherson was in a decidedly better temper. He was quite amiable, and promised Buster half a crown if he would sit, if he could say his numbers up to twelve without a mistake. That reminds me, he broke off and looked at Pansy. Where's the brooch I, bought? I brought you? I should like Ramston to see it. Pansy started and flushed. I think I must have left it in the morning room, she said in confusion. The morning room? A brooch that cost a hundred pounds? What on earth are you thinking about? Pansy started up. I'll fetch it if you will excuse me for a moment. But she was gone some time and came back pale and distressed. It isn't there, and the servants say they haven't seen it. How careless of me. I must have put it somewhere, somewhere else, she explained. What was it like? Joyce asked quickly. She saw the anger in Matherson's eyes. Pansy explained hurriedly. It was in a little white leather box lined with a velvet, and the brooch was a butterfly with diamond wings and eyes. She was very agitated. Somebody must have taken it. Buster chuckled and laid down his spoon. I took it, Dodie, he said calmly. Thank you for listening to Chapter 7 of The Matherson Marriage by Ruby Amers with me. I hope that you have a great day. Bye!